On the 18th of August, 1913, crowds were going wild at the Monte Carlo Casino in Monaco. For the last 10 spins of the roulette table, the ball had landed on black. Thinking that surely the next spin will be red, gamblers from all over the casino started to pile their money on red. With every turn of the wheel, the crowd became more and more convinced that the next turn would be red. They increased their bets and their losses as black came up another 16 times, making a total streak of 26 blacks in a row. The chances of this happening are around 1 in 66 million. The casino made a fortune and the gamblers lost millions in francs, all because they fell prey to the gambler's fallacy. If you were at the Monte Carlo Casino that day, what would you have bet on? Red or black? In this video, we're going to see exactly where the gamblers went wrong and how, with the right thinking, they could have avoided their staggering losses. It's subtler than you might think. Let's start by playing our own game. I don't have a roulette wheel, but I do have something with about the same odds. A coin. We all know that when I flip this guy, there's a half chance it'll land on heads and a half chance it'll land on tails. So, heads or tails? Heads. Guess again. Heads or tails? Heads. Again. Heads or tails? Heads again. One more time, heads or tails? Now before I show you, the chances of four heads in a row are one in 16, or 6.25%. It might be tempting to think that the chances of a tails are higher this time, that a tails is due. If you thought this, you just fell prey to the gambler's fallacy, the false belief that independent past events can affect the likelihood of independent future events in the same random experiment. The coin has no memory of its last three flips. The chances of getting a heads or a tails on the next flip is still one half. In gambling culture, there's an old adage, the dice have no memory. And by the way, the probability of three heads in a row and then a tails is also one in 16. Heads. Totally didn't plan this to make a point, by the way. We see this same faulty reasoning every time you hear someone say, well, you've had three boys, so the next one must be a girl. The chances of having a girl are still around 50-50. Coin flips and childbirths are what's called statistically independent. Each occurrence is independent from previous and future occurrences. We tend to think of chance as self-correcting or that there must be a cosmic balancing out. Because there was a streak of black balls, this needs to be balanced out by some red balls. The gambler's fallacy comes from the fact that we expect statistically independent events to have influence over each other, to balance each other out, when they don't. Now, if that were the end of the story, this would be a pretty boring video. This belief in a cosmic balancing out isn't as silly as it sounds. If I flipped this coin for long enough, we'd start to see something very interesting. Now, I don't have time to sit around all day flipping coins, but I do know of someone who did. In 1939, a South African mathematician named J.E. Kerrick took an ill-advised trip to Europe. Long story short, he ended up in an internment camp in Denmark. Out of curiosity or pure boredom, he flipped a coin 10,000 times and recorded the number of times it landed on heads. His results looked like this. The more times J.E. Kerrick flipped the coin, the number of times he flipped a heads, or in statistics talk, the relative frequency of heads, got closer and closer to 50%. Kerrick only had enough time to do one lot of 10,000 flips, but here are some computer simulations of his same experiment. Every time we see the same pattern, the relative frequency of heads flipped always ends up being around 50%. And this isn't just a feature of coins. With a die, the chances of it landing on each face are 1 in 6, or 16.67%. Here's a computer simulation of 10,000 rolls of a die. The more rolls we make, the relative frequency of each face gets closer and closer to 16.67%. This phenomenon is called the law of large numbers. The more rolls, flips, or trials we do, the closer the relative frequency of the outcome approaches the probability of the event. 
The probability of heads coming up in a single flip is 50%, and after enough flips, the relative frequency of heads flipped is about 50%. The probability of rolling a 3 on a die is 16.67%, and after enough rolls, 3 shows up very close to 16.67% of the time. And you know what? This kind of makes it seem like chance is self-correcting, that there is some sort of cosmic balancing out. So on one hand, we have statistical independence, which tells us that each turn is completely unrelated to the last, that the gamblers were mistaken to think that past results would affect future results. But on the other hand, we have the law of large numbers, which tells us that systems of chance do eventually balance out. So it would seem that the gamblers were right to expect that a red was due after a long streak of black. <sighs> So how can we reconcile these two seemingly paradoxical ideas? Well, contrary to popular belief, size does matter. It's called the law of large numbers for a reason. We only see this uniformity or balancing out after a large number of trials. Small sample sizes often show extreme variability. It's much more likely to see 9 heads in a row than 99 heads in a row. One of the most famous examples of this phenomenon comes from a study done by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The foundation studied educational outcomes in schools and found that small schools were always at the top of the list. Inferring that small schools lead to better education, the foundation applied small school techniques to larger schools, like decreasing class sizes and lowering the student-teacher ratio. But these techniques failed to produce the dramatic gains they were hoping for. Why? Well, one crucial thing the foundation overlooked was that the schools at the bottom of the list were also small schools. It wasn't that small schools perform better, but smaller schools have more variable test scores. The reasoning is simple. A few child prodigies can skew small schools' average up significantly, while a few slackers can skew it down significantly. In a large school, a few extreme scores will just dissolve into the big average, hardly budging the overall number. We can take it a step further and talk about small sample sizes within large sample sizes. You can bet that in Carrick's 10,000 coin flips, he would have seen some long streaks of tails and some long streaks of heads, which would have just ended up dissolving into the big average. If this family had another 1,000 children, we'd see a more even split of boys and girls, though there'd still be some streaks of girls in a row and some streaks of boys in a row. And the 26 blacks at the roulette table were just a relatively short streak in a series of millions of spins. To quote the late astronomer Carl Sagan, randomness is clumpy. The mistake the gamblers made was treating small sample sizes the same as large sample sizes, when they couldn't be more different. Although it wasn't completely unreasonable for the gamblers to bet on red after such a long streak of black, it was still the wrong move because their sample size was much too small to obey the law of large numbers. The cognitive mistake of treating small sample sizes the same as large sample sizes is ironically called the law of small numbers, and it works the other way around too. Sometimes we wrongly infer things about a whole population from a small sample of it. Like if you caught 10 fish, seven of which had gross boils on them, you might infer that 70% of the entire population of that type of fish has gross boils on them. But that would be a mistake, because small sample sizes are not representative of their larger population. Now that we know some of the reasons behind the gambler's fallacy, it's interesting to ask, why do we make these mistakes? Why do we equate smaller sample sizes with larger ones when they're obviously different? Psychologists Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman have proposed it's due to a very strong cognitive bias called representativeness heuristics. A heuristic is a kind of mental shortcut. For example, maybe your grandma is mean, so you conclude that all old grannies are mean. Mental shortcuts like these aren't always accurate, but they allow us to make quick decisions in the absence of information. They ease our cognitive load and save mental resources for other important things. They're deeply ingrained in us and they helped our species survive. Say you're a caveman or woman and you've never seen this animal before. Taking one look at it, would you run or try to pat it? You probably answered run and that's a smart decision. 
Even though you don't know for sure if it's dangerous, it looks very similar to other animals you do know are dangerous. It has sharp teeth like a bear, eight legs like a poisonous spider, and sharp claws like a lion. This particular type of mental shortcut or heuristic is a representativeness heuristic. This animal is representative of other dangerous animals, so you lump it in the same category. But heuristics can also lead us astray. According to Tversky and Kahneman, the gambler's fallacy is an example of this same heuristic leading us astray. We expect our current experiences to be representative of our past experiences. Most families we've encountered have a pretty even split of boys and girls, so we expect that all families we encounter will have a pretty even split of boys and girls. Most of the time we've encountered a random process like a roulette wheel, we've seen a pretty even spread of the available outcomes. For example, black and red spins. So when we see a long streak of blacks in a row, we expect some reds will come along to balance it out because that matches our previous experience. Now, speaking of things that help ease our cognitive load, I'd like to give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, NordVPN. Now, before you click off the video, we spend so much of our lives on the internet. We shouldn't have to spend mental energy worrying about things like privacy, security leaks, getting hacked, safely accessing public Wi-Fi, or people stealing our data. NordVPN makes your life easier by protecting you and your data by keeping it safe behind a wall of next-generation encryption. The main reason I use NordVPN is so I can watch movies and series anywhere in the world, anytime. Not all TV shows and movies are available where I live in Australia, and a lot of the time they take ages to come out. Like, I missed out on watching Breaking Bad for so long because it wasn't on Netflix Australia. I just thought I had to wait months to see a movie everyone was talking about. Or I'd just have to be behind in a series that all of my overseas friends had finished and listened to a bunch of spoilers. I even subscribed to a whole new streaming service to watch movies like Spider-Man Homecoming and Ant-Man because they weren't available on Netflix Australia. That all changed when I started using NordVPN. I could access anything I wanted at any time. If a movie isn't out in Australia yet, I can just switch my location to the US in one click and watch it there. Spider-Man and Ant-Man were on Netflix Canada, so I just switched my location to Canada and watch it there. No more wasting money on multiple streaming subscriptions. And I'm finally on the final season of Breaking Bad and absolutely loving it. It's actually one of my favorite series of all time. I'm almost finished, so don't spoil it for me. If you want to watch a show or movie that's not out in your country yet, you can get NordVPN and watch it right now. There's a link in the description, also a pinned comment. Click on it or go to nordvpn.com slash upandatom to get a huge discount and four months extra. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash upandatom. Thank you, NordVPN, for sponsoring this episode and thank you for watching. Bye.